to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says in psalm 127 verse 1 unless the lord builds the house they labor in vain who build it. We welcome you today to our study of godly homes in a godly, ungodly world. Today we're thinking about how to have a successful marriage, preparation and taking the right steps for a successful marriage, a marriage that will last and a marriage that will honor God where both people are happy and healthy and trying to get to heaven as our ultimate goal. And so we're so glad that you've joined us today for our study. We want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible handy, to locate your Bible and have it ready to use as we want to let God give us advice on a successful marriage from His Word. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members and individual congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about church, about the church or the plan of salvation or whatever it may be, you'll find people at the church who love God, who are kind and sincere and who want to help others get to heaven. And so we hope you'll visit the Lord's Church in your area whether it be on Sunday or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study, they'd be glad to have you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson on godly homes in an ungodly world, you can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can fill out a media request form, not only for this series of lessons, but for any lesson. We provide those to you in DVD and CD. You can download it immediately for a free digital download. We'll send those to you free of charge. We'll even pay the postage on the DVD and CD. And so our aim is to help men and women to know God and to get to heaven. In the fast-paced world in which we live in, we also want to encourage you, whether it be with an iPhone or an Android, to check out our app from the designated app stores. It's a great way to study God's Word in a fast-paced world that we live in today. And so let's begin by thinking about what are some things God tells us we can do to prepare for a successful marriage. Friend, we begin by noting that Preparation is a necessary part of life. Anything you do, you're going to need preparation for. Uh, whether you buy a home, you're going to need to make preparation. You've got to get all your documents ready. You've got to have the money. You've got to get approved. There's a lot of preparation that goes into buying a home or buying a car. If you're going to start a business, there's a lot of preparation work, prep work you've got to do to make that a successful business. Well, friend, marriage requires preparation as well. You can't just wake up one day and think you're going to know all about it and it's going to be okay. You've got to prepare ahead of time to be a successful marriage. And this is a biblical idea. For example, the Bible teaches preparation is uh, important to have a success in anything. For example, Matthew 25. You've got the story of the bridegroom and the ten virgins. Five of those virgins, they prepared. They went and got their oil ahead of time. They were ready. When the bridegroom came, they could immediately go with him because they prepared ahead of time for that event. The five foolish virgins, they weren't prepared. And when they went to get prepared, they were left out. Uh, we, again, this is something the Bible teaches. Luke 14, you've got the idea of counting the cost. Matthew 26, Jesus prepared in the garden for the suffering that would come. And so we want to ask and think about, are you prepared for marriage? And what does a person have to do to prepare po properly to be married and to be a good spouse in a marriage relationship? Let's begin by thinking about these preparations that are necessary. Part of preparing for marriage means I need to realize I cannot focus on beauty and the outward appearance and the aesthetics alone. Beauty alone cannot prepare me 
for marriage. Look in your Bible in Proverbs chapter 31, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in Proverbs chapter 31. What's really to be desired? I understand we all have attractions. I understand that we have certain likes and dislikes, and that in and of itself is not wrong. But you can't put your focus on the physical and the beauty alone and think that's going to make a good marriage. Look at Proverbs 31, verse number 30. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. You ever heard someone say, oh, I like him, he's just so charming, or she is so beautiful and attractive, and while those things may play a part in it, while attraction is a part of marriage, friend, it can't be the major reason I marry somebody. A woman who fears the Lord, she'll be praised. Where's our emphasis and where's our focus at in preparing to marry? And friend, we don't mean this to sound disrespectful, but I want you to, add, I want you to think about more than just the immediate attraction. What happens in that marriage two years from now, five years from now, 25 years from now, or 50 years from now? You're not going to look quite the same you did when you first got married. And when the honeymoon wears off, and that attraction physically is not as strong. You tried to make that the big factor in the marriage, and when that attraction wanes, there's got to be something that you've prepared for other than just that, and you want to find somebody who fears the Lord and who's going to help you to be a good Christian and to go to heaven. What else do we need to prepare for to have a successful marriage? Friend, we need to prepare by realizing marriage is for life. This is a big, big part of preparing for a successful marriage. I want you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's no doubt this idea is clearly taught in Romans 7 verses 2 and 3 where marriage is until death. But look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about this same idea on marriage being for life. I want you to look in verse number 39. Paul says, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to remarry whom she wishes only in the Lord. She is bound by law as long as her husband lives. What law? God's law. That law that goes back to Genesis 2 verse 24 that says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. For this reason, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 6, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Friend, you're making to prepare for a successful marriage. You've got to think about and think clearly through the commitment you're making. You are making a commitment for life. You're making a commitment through thick and thin, through good and bad, through up and down, through rich and poor, to stay together and to make it work out. And so prepare for marriage by realizing it's for life. And then I want you to think about this with me. We want to prepare for a successful marriage and the ability to help us stick in there and work it through by realizing divorce, that's not a part of God's original plan. Malachi 2 verse 16, God hates divorce. I want you to open your Bible, if you would, to Luke 16. I want you to see Jesus is going to go back to the original pattern on marriage. And I want you to look in Luke chapter 16 and see what Jesus says about God's original pattern for marriage and how that it is, divorce is not an option in God's original plan. Luke chapter 16 and verse number 18. Jesus said this, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. What about trading wives and get tired of it, I can just change and find somebody else? No. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Friend, to prepare for a successful marriage, I need to realize divorce is not an option. What are we saying by that? We're going to make it work. We're going to do our dead level best to help one another, 
to work through the difficulties. Are there going to be challenges? Sure. Are there going to be days where it's difficult? No doubt. Are there going to be things where you've got to learn to compromise and get along and you may not always get your way and uh, mom and dad may have tried to make you happy but now it's a little different? There's going to be times like that. You've got to mature and grow up and realize divorce. Just because it may not be everything, just because every day may not make me 100% happy doesn't mean I can just break it up and go on and do something else. Realize in God's original plan, divorce was not an option. Do, do I understand Jesus taught in Matthew 19, 9 that uh, for fornication, the innocent party could divorce their mate. And I understand that. But friend, that's, that's not God's original plan. God's original plan is what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And so in preparing for marriage, let's realize divorce was not a part of that. Part of the preparation also for a successful marriage is to realize living together is not the way to prepare. Living together before marriage is sinful and that is not going to help you prepare for a successful marriage. Here's how we think about it. We think about sometimes, and I mean by society, sometimes we as a society think about marriage in the sense of buying a new car. For example, we mean this. I see a car going down the road. I'm in the market for a new car and I think to myself, you know, I might like that car and so what do I do? I go to the dealership and I test drive that car. You know, sometimes they might even let you take it home for the night. Take that car, I'm going to test drive it, I'm going to take it home, I'm going to see if I really like it, see if it fits me well. If not, then I haven't lost anything. Friend, I think sometimes that's how we look at living together. I can test drive this for a little while, see if it's going to work, see if it makes me happy, see if we're compatible, and if not, then nothing gained, nothing lost. Friend, that's not true because that's not according to God's plan for marriage. You do the figuring out ahead of time. You ask the right questions. You see if you're compatible. You see if you're both really putting God first. And we're going to give helps in this lesson for finding that out. But living together before time, that's not what you do to figure it out. In fact, God teaches that's wrong. Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Marriage is honorable. That's holy, that's right, that's good. Marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled. The sexual relation in marriage, good, right, and holy. Listen to this though. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That's not right. Shacking up, uh, trying it out ahead of time, getting involved in the sexual relation before marriage. Friend, that's not how you figure it out. That's going to make the marriage feel less holy. That's going to make the marriage feel less godly. You're going to look back on that and you're going to wish you had waited for marriage and to realize how special and holy it is when you do that because God says so. And then as we think about the idea of preparing for marriage, I want you to consider this as well. How do you prepare for a, success, a successful marriage? Well, friend, you prepare by asking good questions ahead of time. You know, sometimes we think if if, if I say this, or if I ask this, or if I push this person on this issue, they might not want to be with me anymore. Well, friend, if that's what your marriage is built on, it's probably not going to, the relationship is built on, it might not ask, last anyway. You need to ask the right questions ahead of time. And, and let's mention some of those. What kind of questions does a person need to ask to prepare for a successful marriage? Number one, you need to ask, and you need to be thinking and figuring out for yourself are they a faithful Christian? You know, sometimes we say to our young people, you need to marry a Christian, but really we need to amend that. You need to marry a faithful Christian. Is this person a faithful child of God? Meaning, are they seeking first the kingdom of God? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Has this person truly been crucified with Christ and have they died to, him, died to self and are they living for Him every day? You need to ask, do they love God more than they love me? Matthew 10 verse 37, he, Jesus said, He who does not love uh, me more than, who do, he who loves father, mother, brother, and sister more than me is not worthy of me. Do they love God more than they love me? Are they a faithful Christian? Do they attend the assembly of the saints? Are they actively involved in the work of the church? Are they trying to reach lost souls? Are they studying the Bible? Are they praying? Are they a real genuine Christian? 
And are they faithfully following the Lord? Secondly, in asking the right questions, ask this. Will the person that I'm considering marrying, will they solve their problems biblically? Meaning, when problems come up in the marriage, and they will, we're not all, you know, we're not mindless drones or robots where everybody's going to think alike on everything. There are going to be disagreements. There are going to be problems. There are going to be moral issues that arise. When those issues arise, will they solve the problem based on the Bible? Now, friend, here's why we ask this. A lot of people solve the problem in a lot of ways that are not putting the Bible first, meaning sometimes people try to solve the problem based on emotion. Are they going to put their feelings? Are they going to put their emotion? Are they going to put what, what might make them more happy ahead of what the Bible says? Are they going to try to solve the problem by looking at what society thinks the right answer might be? Are they going to try to solve the problem by running to mom and dad and asking what they might do in this situation? I want to find somebody who's going to say, we're going to, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to let the Bible be the answer to every problem. We're going to look at it together. We're going to work it out, and we're going to let God's voice be the ultimate voice that we hear. Here's another question to ask. Is that, does this person have a direction they're headed in, and is it the right direction? By that we mean, do they have a purpose? Do they have a, a destination in life? Are they trying to, do they have goals and uh, things they're trying to achieve, and is it headed in the right direction? You know, see, we all ought to have direction to our life, right? Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3, If then you are raised with Christ, here's the direction, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't set your mind on things below, set your mind on things above. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 3, O magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt His name together. And so we, we want to ask, do they have direction in life? Do they have goals? Are they making things they're trying to achieve? And is that the right direction? I don't want, you don't want to get hooked up with somebody who has no goals, who has no dreams, who has no uh, desire to do anything. Their desire is basically zero, and they have no drive. You want somebody who has a drive and direction, wants to get out and do stuff, and, and wants to better themselves and better others as well. And then, friend, ask this. What does this person believe about the following things? What do they believe about, about God? Do they believe there is a God? You know, friend, if you, we don't want to be unkind, but of all things, marry a Christian. Someone's rightly said, if you marry a child of the devil, you're going to have trouble with your father-in-law. And that's exactly right. If you marry someone who's not a Christian, can we say kindly, you're not, you're, not, you're not equally yoked. You don't have the same values. You may like each other. There may be some physical attraction. But what about when moral issues arise that you have good morals on and they may not? What about when children come in? What about when you're trying to raise children? What about when difficulties come up? What about when problems arise in the marriage and they don't have those values? What do they believe? Do they believe there is a God? Do they believe in putting God first? What do they believe about the church? Do they recognize the oneness of the church? That Jesus built His church? That the church ought to come first in our decision making, in our giving, in our, in our, our work, in our effort? What do they believe about salvation? They believe that you say the sinner's prayer and you're saved? Do they believe that you know, everybody's saved? What do they believe about that? What do they believe about moral decisions? Abortion, drinking, uh, things involved in marriage? What do they believe about that that's going to affect your marriage morally? And friend, if you find yourself on these questions more out of agreement than you are in agreement, please hear me well on this. Getting married is not going to fix that problem. Now you've tied yourself to that, and you're going to have to encourage and work overtime to bring that person where they ought to be, spiritually speaking. And there's going to be resistance, and there's going to be problems. I'm not saying it can't be done. But friend, in preparation for marriage, marry a Christian. Marry a faithful child of God who holds the same values and morals you do. Then ask yourself this question about the individual. The person I'm considering marrying, 
How important is worship to that person? Well, let's back up and ask the question, how important is worship? God views worship as very important, right? Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7 says, O come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. He is our God. We are His creature, or His people. We're the sheep of His hand. We're to worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse 24, we are to not forsake the assembly when we come together with others to worship. And so ask yourself, how does this person feel about worship? Do they give worshiping God a priority in their life? Do they believe that we ought to attend every assembly of the saints to worship together with others? Are they going to encourage and help me? Are they going to make me worship better? Are they going to be a distraction? And Are they going to sit there with a long face and wish they weren't there? You want to find somebody you can worship God with. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Psalm 34, verse number 3. And then consider this question. How do they feel about children? Children are a gift from God. Psalm 127, verse number 3. God wants godly children. God wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Is this person going to be a good father or mother? Are they going to help with the children? Are they going to expect me to do it all myself? Are they going to help? Or are they going to be an encouragement when it comes to discipline and training and helping those children get to heaven? Are they going to be consistent and stand where they ought to when it comes to making decisions that the children at that day and age may not necessarily like? How will they do with children? And then, friend, consider this. This is a real important one, and I think sometimes people don't think about when we enter into marriage. How's this person with his finances? How does this person handle his money now? Because the way they handle it now is likely going to be the way they handle it or want to handle it when they get into marriage. Do they go and blow? Do they buy all kind of new things? Uh, is it all about the next big thing they can buy for themselves? Are they selfish and self-centered and a big spender? If so, you better be thinking about that. How do they handle their money? Are they going to help me? to be a better giver, uh, give unto the Lord like we ought to? Are they going to help us to, to save and to use our money wisely? Is He going to be a good provider? First Timothy 5 verse 8, if a man won't take care of his own, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an infidel. And so, you know, among the things people fight about, one of the biggest is money. Are you compatible financially? Do you both realize money is a gift from God and we want to use it to His glory and to take care of each other and our family. If not, again, you're going to be unequally yoked and there are going to be problems in that marriage. Ask yourself this, in counseling with people, many times I sit down with someone after they've been married a couple of years and they say to me, this person has a bad temper. And I'll ask them, well, did they ever get, have a temper when you were dating? Yeah, but I didn't think it would be a problem. Friend, if they've got a temper now, I can assure you it's going to be a problem in a marriage. If they can't control it, they fly off the handle, they get angry, they say things they shouldn't say, and you can see their temper right now. Listen carefully to me. When the honeymoon's over and the attraction comes down a little bit, and it might, that temper is liable to come out on you. They've got anger problems now. Friend, you need to realize that may be a situation you don't, but, oh, but I love him. Okay. Do you love him when he's angry at you, when he's hollering at you, when he's yelling at you, and when things are not like they used to be? Oh, but he's so cute. Well, how cute is he when he scowls and he puts his fist up? Do you really think that's worth it? I want you to think about that person's temper ahead of time. Do they have a good work ethic? You know, we want to find somebody who will work hard, who will do what God wants us to do, who will love God and who will love one another in every way. And friend, again, as we kind of bring things full circle. In marriage, in preparing for a successful marriage, we cannot emphasize enough how important it is for you not only to marry a Christian, to marry a faithful Christian. Marry somebody who, listen, you need to marry somebody who loves God and who loves the Lord more than they love you. Let me share with you one study about this. There was a study done in Oklahoma 
of 140 young people and their marriages. And here's what the results of that study were. A few years later, they looked back at that marriage, and here's what they found. Of people who married non-Christians, a Christian, non-Christian, there were a total of 79 couples total. In those of the 140, 79 in that marriage study married Christian, non-Christian. Of those, 57 had left the church years later. 22 were still faithful. Two-thirds were no longer in the church. Why? Maybe they didn't have the help they needed. In those 140 young people, um, 14 were Christians and uh, they converted their mates. And that's good. 25 of those were divorced years later. Again, nearly double that number divorced than converted their mates. And so sometimes we think, well, he may not be a Christian, but I can convert him. You might, and some do, but more get divorced than convert their mates. Here's a good number, though. In the Christian Christian marriages, there were 64 people who married a faithful Christian, who married a Christian. Of those, five left the church. Fifty-nine were faithful and were still married to the Lord. Friend, that's good results. That's the kind of things we want to hear. And so what are we trying to drive home? Marry a faithful Christian. Think about it. Don't think to yourself, It'll, we'll, whatever problems there are, we'll fix those after the marriage. That don't work. That don't happen. You make it improve some, but chances are it's going to be what it's going to be. That's part of their life. And so marry a faithful Christian. I'm not saying we can't all improve and can't make headway. Friend, you will do yourself such a big favor if you marry a faithful Christian. Why? Because then you can do what Psalm 34, 3 says. You can magnify the Lord with me. We can exalt His name together. And so we hope today that we have offered some helps in preparing for a successful marriage and that you'll take the advice we're giving from the Word of God today and heed that so that one day you can have a marriage that one day you can hear your name and your spouse's name called before the throne of God. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. We'll hope you'll join us next time as we think more about God homes in an ungodly world. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.